I bring in to you today three ideas or three challenges that the chemistry will need to face over the next decades. Depending on the answers we are capable of giving to these, to these problems, depends very much what will be our future in terms of sustainability and what will be the future for our next generations. The first idea I would like to show to you has to do with this, this second revolution in catalysis. Let's start thinking, take a minute to think about what are the implications of chemistry in your life. We usually think about chemistry as something that is quite, quite nas uh, nasty. But if you think about that, there is not that many materials that you have in nature and that you can use directly for your daily life. Think about transportation, your cars, your flights. They are all full of materials that at some point they needed some kind of chemical transformation. Think about also, for example, on the production of agriculture. I mean, there is no way that we will be able to sustain to feed the actual population in the Earth if we won't have access to these fertilizers, in some cases, these pesticides. Think about also your houses, your clothes. All of them, they come from materials that at some point come from a reaction, from a chemical reaction. And finally, probably the most interesting one is think about life expectancy. I mean, our expectancy of life have just more than doubled over the, over the last century. And part of this has to be with our ability to create drugs that improve our health. In all of that, chemistry is involved. Chemistry, indeed, is involved in about 30% of the GDP of, of developed countries like UK. And most of the chemical transformations that have been carrying out nowadays, they are doing with the help of catalysis. Catalysis are those elements that are dumped into the reactions, they enable the reactions, sometimes they make it possible when they are not possible anymore. In other cases, what they do is that they facilitate simply the reactions. About 80% of the reactions are nowadays carried out with catalysis. But for new processes that are being developed, this number goes up to 90%. The reason is simple that reactions, catalyzed reactions, are more efficient in terms of energy and also in terms of waste. So actually, that means that those reactions help on sustainability reasons. The simplest idea of the catalysis is what you have in any of your cars, in the exhaust of your cars. The catalyst is what allows you that after the combustion, these gases go out and you will avoid contaminants before they go into the atmosphere. Now, over the last century, chemistry has developed a myriad of reactions. And the mass majority of these reactions are just based on the ability to use metal as, as catalysts. And this is on the basis of all the textbooks. And this has been recognized with several Nobel laureates. The question is that the metals that are currently being used in catalysis are those heavy, heavy metals. Those are precious metals. The problem with these metals is that these metals are very rare, they are very scarce, and currently they are already very, very expensive. Now, if you look at how is evolving the prices of these metals over years, what you will realize is that the price is going up, is going up, is going up. And it's going to be much worse when the demand is keep, keep increasing. The most what is really most important is that there are some, some models that predict that we might actually run out of these metals in 20 years. Imagine what does this mean. It means that basically some of our industry might be just shut up because we don't have the sources anymore. And if you think about that, there's still nowadays there are already countries when they resolve their conflicts just by closing the access to some, mean, uh, some metal mines. So this is becoming, and it's going to become really, really serious. Now, what we would like to do, and what we and others would like to do, is develop chemistry that is based on metals that are more abundant. The metals, those first road transition metals, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, they are widely available, and they are cheap. And this is something that we can think of, of making chemistry. So 
Is that a dumb idea? And the question is that this idea is actually what nature has already done. Nature has evolved by learning how to use these metals. And the reason is that these metals are the ones that it has available. So chemistry in, bi in biological systems is actually governed by these first row transition metals. The thing about that is that if, when you start looking at cost, and in this case, iron is probably the most interesting one, look at the cost of this metal. When for one reaction, if we normalize iron for one, you might find the actual reactions that are carried out by platinum, it become about one million times more expensive. So it becomes quite obvious what, are the, what is the interest on developing chemistry with these first row transition metals. So the first idea I would like to bring to you is that if catalysis has meant a revolution for chemical synthesis, we actually are in the need to develop a second revolution where we will change all these metals, also these heavy metals, for first row transition metals. There is a, ne a new question that I haven't told you about that is quite important. If we think about sustainability, all these heavy metals I told you about, they are extremely toxic. But when we talk about iron, we are talking about a metal that has absolutely no toxicity. Indeed, there are ecosystems where iron becomes the limiting source for life. The next idea I would like to bring to you in the terms of sustainability is that we need to simplify chemical synthesis. We are chemists. I am a chemist, let's put it that way. And as a chemist, we love and our aim is to make new molecules, as complicated as possible, okay? Now, what we need is we need to find methods to simplify the chemistry. We want to make these very complicated molecules, but we want to make them in a very simple manner. Any of you, if we're given with one of these molecules, you might think about methods to preparing it as if they were just sticks. Just make it put in the sticks together in a very, very simple manner, okay? This will be the ideal, world, the ideal way of making that. The problem is that we don't know how to do that. We don't have the handles for doing that. We don't know the chemistry for doing that. So actually, what we end up doing is something like that. And this is where we are right now. So our idea is that we need to find methods, new methods in chemistry that allow us to go for straight methods. One of these ideas is this simple reaction, just taking a CH bond and converting it into an OH bond. Why is this reaction so interesting? The first thing is that this OH is found in a number of natural products. Almost any natural product, any product that has biological relevance, it has this functional group. On the other hand, there is these very small molecules, ethanol, methanol. Those are molecules that also contain this OH. And the important thing about them is that you can think about these molecules also as a fuels. So they are quite interesting molecules. And the most interesting thing is that if we can prepare these molecules they directly by taking a hydrocarbon, a CH1, and convert it in directly into an OH. That will be the most interesting one. Basically, because molecules with CH bonds are ubiquitous. Any organic molecule you might think of, it has OH bonds. So it's a very, very convenient starting point. So, okay, that looks like a very simple reaction. So what is the problem? The problem is that this one is really, really strong. This is something that you cannot just pull up. You cannot break that easily. So basically, what you need is to develop reagents that allows you to break this one. And to do that, you need catalysts that are extremely, extremely reactive, extremely hot. The problem here is that if you have something that is extremely reactive, extremely hot, it also, you have problems of selectivity. Basically, because you are dealing with something, you want to hit something that is very inert, but you don't want to hit other things. So this is a problem. This is a paradoxical problem. We need something that is extremely reactive, but just exclusively for these bonds, uh, tend to be inert. The second question is that CH bonds are everywhere. Any organic molecule has a number of CH bonds. So how do you manage to get something that heats exclusively at one of the CH bonds? This is a problem. This is a challenge for modern chemistry. But the implications of developing methods for doing that will be huge. 
Now, again, we take back inspiration from nature. It turns out that nature has enzymes called oxygenases that are capable of doing this chemistry. We are right now, we don't know how to do that in the, lab, in, in the laboratory, but nature knows how. Those metals are based, again, on non-toxic metals. Iron, for example, they employ oxygen. We would like to use something like H2O2, that will be a surrogate of oxygen. And what we will do is to prepare these small molecules that try to reproduce a structural aspects of the active site of the enzymes, with the hope that we can reproduce the chemistry. Finally, those types of structures can reproduce the, in a very, very simple manner the active site of the enzyme. Does it work? And let me show you that it actually works. You take an organic molecule, a rather complicated structure. We don't need, you don't need to know that much chemistry to see that there is up to 13 positions that you can hit. Still, with one of these catalysts, this bio-inspired catalyst, with an oxidant, you are specifically capable of hitting only one position. So we hope that this method will also allow you, or will be a revolution in chemical synthesis. The next question, probably the most urgent one, has to do with artificial photosynthesis. The problem we have is what is happening with energy. We are a society that is thirsty for energy. If we look at the prediction of our necessity of energy for the next 20 years, we will find out that the prediction is that we will need an increase of about 40%. There is no way that we can support that just with fossil fuels, okay? There is a lifetime for these fossil fuels and we are running out of time. There is other possibilities, are those renewables. And the problem with the renewables is that most of them need to be used at the point where they are generated. For example, um, uh, energy coming from uh, the photovoltaic, photovoltaic uh, device. And obviously, there is nuclear power. But I think that after this summer, few of us will support nuclear power right now. There is other problem about these uh, fusel fuels. And is that when we burn it, we generate CO2. And we know that there is an obvious connection be between this CO2 and global warming. So we need to find other sources of energy. The most interesting one has to do with photosynthesis. Let me explain you about what is possible, possibly the most important reaction in Earth. It's the simple reaction I'm showing you here. You don't need to know that much chemistry about organics. This is probably the reaction that controls life in our planet. In one way, the conversion of oxygen into water is something that occurs in all, oxy, uh, in all living organisms that work under aerobic conditions. This is just respiration. This is the way we get energy. On the other hand, is the back reaction, the conversion of water into oxygen. This is the reaction that takes place in photosystems. OK, the thing is that this, energy this reaction requires energy, and this energy comes from sun. The important thing here is that in this reaction, you generate protons and you generate four electrons. You can think about catalysts, and this is really simple, that will simply combine the hydrogen and the electrons and will generate hydrogen. Hydrogen is the fuel for the future. This is something that is really, really interesting. And we actually do have catalysts that do this reaction very well. So this is a soft technology. The, problem, the important thing is that then you combine hydrogen with oxygen, combustion, you generate energy, and you generate back water. You recycle, you don't generate waste. So this is a dream reaction. What is the problem here? The problem here is actually is where the electrons come from. The electrons come from the water, from the oxygen molecule. From, I'm sorry, from the water molecule. This has to be transformed into oxygen. Now, you might think, if the problem is where the electrons come from, and it has to do with water, oxidizing water, converting water into oxygen, well, why don't we take some other molecule that can give us just electrons? Well, that is not such simple. Think about that. 
We need to do this reaction if massive scale. We need something that gives electrons in a massive scale and actually does not generate waste. The only way of doing that is with water because the product, the byproduct, is oxygen. Now, the thing is what about, so what we need actually is to find catalysts to convert water into oxygen. This is the key point that needs to be addressed in this technology. What I'm showing you here is a blank experiment and a solution with an iron catalyst. We add an oxidant, and you can see here, is a burst of bubbles. What I'm showing you is that iron catalysts are capable of doing this transformation, and they do extremely, extremely efficiently. This is kind of a dream reaction. There's a number of people that is going after that, and the reason and the, to be able to see that iron is capable of doing this transformation is just a beautiful or beautiful news for the future. So the thing is that these iron catalysts are very simple. We can modify them. We can generate a number of catalysts. We can optimize it. We can think about generating a number of different catalysts and finding the most efficient one. And finally, what we want in the future, this is something we have not come to, is the design the artificial leaf. Something that will get sun, will regenerate a positive charge. This positive charge eventually will get oxidation of water and from here will generate hydrogen. We hope that this can be one of the technologies of the future. With that, I hope I have shown you that we have very serious challenges, very serious technological challenges that will have to be solved in the next decade. But I also have my faith that science is calling, is being called to produce solutions, and some of these solutions are on their way. Thank you very much for your